Hi, folks. This is Dr. Rob Sivas. I am, as you know, the carb addiction doc. And again, we have this wonderful, I, you know, I know it's wonderful for me because this is what gets my juices flowing. Lat Mansur of uh, Ketone IQ is with us again. And we're going to just shoot the breeze on a few things. The, the amazing thing about this space, the ketogenic space, is it's so rapidly moving. Farmers getting involved, industries getting involved, people are you know, as much as the standard American diet people want to swap this horrible fly and make it go away, we haven't gone away. We've become stronger and stronger. And that is primarily based on the research and the the experimentation that our patients are doing or that people in the public are doing, and they're finding good results. Same thing with the ketones. The, the feedback I'm getting from so many people is so positive. And of course, there are places where they work, places where they won't. We're still trying to figure all of this out. So I thank you very much for coming along. And um, there will be a series of these kind of question-specific uh, videos that we're going to do. So thank you so much. And uh, welcome back from Malaysia as well. Thank you so much, Rob. And it has been a pleasure, you know, was here before and it's a pleasure now. Uh, I look forward to our conversation as always, because we know that we do get into the nitty gritty details of metabolism, of the science, and we are quite, you know, transparent about it. And we are quite, you know, skeptical about everything, of course. And I think that's that's what we need, um, an eye of skepticism when it comes to science and studies, because everyone can claim anything these days. So we want to make sure that we are relaying the correct information and combat misinformation, really, with the boom of short form content and internet and you know, TikToks and all of that. So there's so much out there. And nowadays people are like, so you can't eat fruits, you can't eat meat, you can't eat plants, you can't eat, you know, anything. You can't eat bread. It's at the end of the day, it's like you can't eat anything anymore. You're absolutely right. And, you know, just as, a, as an interlude there, my, my favorite statement is the internet is a great place to get good ideas, but a terrible place to get good advice. And yeah. my, my advice to my patients is, you know what? If something seems plausible, do the experiment. Don't believe what you've said. If something's safe and it might have benefit, create an experiment for yourself where you say, okay, I'm going to take ketone IQ each morning, or I'm going to take it before my tennis match, or I'm going to take it on days. And this is a question we're going to ask you now on days when I'm fasting. And determine for yourself, do the experiment. Is there a benefit? Is there a liability? But don't just do it once. Uh, you really want to prime yourself. Science doesn't, the human body doesn't just respond in a one shot. It's got to be conditioned. There are multiple pathways involved. So do it for a while and then you can determine for yourself over an eight or a 12 week course, is there benefit? Is there no benefit? Is there liability? And that is then the decision that you make. Wow, tremendous benefit. And that's what I've done. So there are places where I've used ketone IQ personally. Nah, it didn't work so good. Other places where, wow, this is huge. And along those lines, um, one of the things that I've been dabbling with quite a bit, it just each month I create new little things for me to do. And June has been for me a, a no calorie Monday. So I typically eat once a day during the week and I'll eat dinner on a Sunday night and then eat again dinner on a Tuesday night, skipping Monday. So 48 hour fast. It's about a 48 hour, uh, 48 hour fast. Correct. And the question that I have, and I'll give you my early experimentation what advice, what thoughts are there on the use of ketones in the variety of fasting meta uh, fasting methodologies? There's the extended fast, which for me are beyond 24 hours. Some people are trying to get into prolonged intermittent fasting, maybe eating once a day or even twice a day. What are your thoughts? What are the uses? What advice? What feedback have you, you had in that regard? That's a great question. But before I go into that, I want to point out that you made a great point earlier. When you hear something from the internet, make like do the experiment yourself because a lot of people don't realize that you don't need to be a scientist to run experiments, especially when you are running it on your own body. All you need is good tracking, good monitoring, good record keeping, and also really dial in how you feel subjectively and you will know your body better than anyone. 
Um, so that's that's a great point. And there are so, a lot of equip bits of equipment that you can now use for home testing. Dave Feldman is the lipid guy who tests on himself. Yes. Now we've got keto mojos, we've got ketone testing, we've got CGMs. There's a variety of ways you can analyze your own data objectively. So I like that. You re you're right to reinforce that. Thank you. Yes. Um, so back to your question on fasting and ketone IQ. Uh, it's funny you say that because as uh, I think earlier this year, I actually did it myself. I did a 48 hour fast using just ketone IQ and water. So no food at all. And I measured my ketone levels, my glucose levels. And it was, it was much easier than I expected because of ketone IQ. And what I have done there is I have ketone IQ once in the morning, once at night, you know, just one shot of like 10 grams. So not a lot. And, and one, one dose of that is like 70 calories. So um, I, I managed to one, curb my appetite using ketone IQ. And two, during those 48 hours, I also had in-person podcasts. So I had to use my brain. I have to have the energy as well. So that, that really provide, provided me with the energy I needed. And um, it definitely helped putting me in, in the state of flow when I need to be coherent and I need to be able to ask relevant questions to my guests and, and carry on my day. And I found that so powerful because, you know, most people, they might be struggling when they do extended amount, uh, a period of time when they're fasting and they're thinking of food or they're just lethargic and they're going through fatigue. And I think ketone IQ fixes all of that. It gives you energy. It gives your brain energy it curbs your appetite so you don't even feel hungry. It has direct effect on ghrelin, hunger hormone, as well as leptin sensitizing effect, specifically butendiol, which is the active ingredient in ketone IQ. So it fixes all of that. And then some people also ask, well, if it's calor calorific, wouldn't that break my fast? So to that, then my answer is that what are you fasting for, right? If you're fasting for calorie restriction, calorie, calorie deficit, then it shouldn't because it's only 70 calories, right? And you're still not eating food. And overall, you're still having way less calories than you would otherwise if you're not fasting. And secondly, if you are doing the fast for autophagy, for example, then people are like, okay, it might kick me out of autophagy or it might delay autophagy. But then Let's go back to metabolism. Let's go back to the science real quick here. What kickstarted, um, what kickstarts uh, autophagy that is the very low glucose levels, the very low insulin levels, and that gives the signal to the body that, you know, you need to kickstart ketogenesis. You need to kickstart um, the breakdown of your storage and, and really recycle whatever material that you don't need in the body, i.e. autophagy, in order to create the energy that you need. So ketone IQ, one, not only it does not increase glucose level, it actually has been shown consistently to drop glucose, blood glucose level about an hour after you have it to about 50 points. And two, it definitely does not increase insulin levels. So while you're fasting, you are maintaining a very low glucose and insulin level while having that benefit of you know, appetite suppression as well as energy to your brain. So I think that answers it all. It does not break your autophagy. Uh, in fact, it just helps you reach the autophagy state without going through that grueling hunger and um, and fatigue levels. I, I, I that appreciate that. And I, I completely concur. I just uh, recently ran a couple of uh, um, of these podcasts on fasting and just really looking at the pearls of fasting. Jason Fung is uh, someone I've co-wrote a book with and I know I've known him for a very long time. And I think as we get into the industry, there are a number of products out there that I'm being sent. Um, oh, this is the fasting stuff. And I just did a breakdown of this stuff. It's called Fasting RX. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a liquid, um, uh, it's basically a calorie-free or supposedly calorie-free, uh, it says zero calories on it, uh, drink with a number of electrolytes and also some vitamins, uh, minerals, that kind of thing, formulated for fasting. So this is the sales pitch. And I really like this stuff. I really, really liked it. Uh, tastes great. It has all, it, it meets all the right, pushes all the right buttons for me. 
They say zero calories, but there's actually, if you look in the details, there's seven grams of sugar. Total carbohydrates are seven grams. So it didn't quite compute with me. Right. On the show that I did, uh, and I really like this. I cracked open. Is that one. maybe it. maybe it's a net net carbs? Well, they talk about zero net carbs, but when you talk about calories, calories are calories. Right. Right. And right. Right. So what they did is the the uh, carbs came or the total carbs came from erythritol, which they they counted in there. But the okay. interesting thing when I did this, and I did it on on a show, and I was wearing a CGM, and I was I was twenty four hours into a fast, so I run ver what would be considered to be low blood sugars. So I was running in the 55, 56 range for my blood sugars. Now my ketones typically are around one to 1.5 when I'm running that low. And I use the Keto Mojo to test that. So I knew what my numbers were. And I drank this on screen. And within a few minutes, my blood sugar went up to 67. So there was a you know 12 point rise, which is very unusual for me as an acute rise. And that came from this drink. And I really liked this drink, but I was disappointed with that. I then did another experiment. Uh, this is something you may not have heard of. It's called Keto and IQ. Uh, <laughs> and uh, these are the individuals. So these are the ones that I, yeah, you got it right. Yeah. The individuals, you can get the bigger ones. These are just convenient for me. And my personal experience was that when I do an extended, now I, I was looking at a 48 hour fast. I've recently done a five day. And what I find the most challenging time is that first meal that I'm not eating. So I've got a routine of eating once a day when I work. I'm very comfortable getting to eight, nine o'clock at night. But there's a little bit of hangriness that happens at that time because that's an expected feed for me. Mm -hmm. And if I do a ketone IQ, it bridges me across that. I actually do my ketone IQ now and I use a big mug of bone of uh, bone or beef broth and I throw salt in there. I throw about five grams of Redmond salt in there. Okay, which is my electrolyte requirement. And what I found is the paradox is that my blood sugar does not move. So there's no change in my CGM. If anything, it might even go down a point or two if I'm running slightly high. When I went high for me is above 70, um, which I know is, is, is a bit odd out there. Right. But the other part is that within about an hour, my ketones go super high. They go up into the four to five range which is okay for me. I'm okay. I don't want to go higher than that. Right. And I, I, I tend to drift down. I also go for my run in the evenings on these days. So I'm fasting with a run. And what I found is number one, it bridges me across any need to eat. So it gets me across that most difficult meal, which is the first one I skip. Secondly, because it gets me into ketosis, it makes that run a little bit easier. And on the run, I can actually bring my key. Now look, running for me is like other people could walk fast beside me. I'm not a an athlete, but it does help me to get into ketosis. Why am I doing all of that? Because the purpose of my fasting is to get into deep ketosis, to be able to burn some fat, to, to drop or manage a little bit of weight. That's not the primary indication, but really to put my cells into what I call utilization phase, which is when we eat, you go into storage phase dominated by insulin, growth hormone, testosterone, T3. Then you flip over and you store that food and now your cells are making a demand for energy. And I want to redirect them to using ketones and fat as a primary energy source. And I can augment that with a ketone IQ. So for me, that has been a wonderful time to do that. And then at the 48 hour mark, I may take it again. So that corroborates what you were just saying. And certainly from a, a nutritional benefit perspective, I'm not certain about the autophagy. I know it's happening, but that's what's leveraged me across there. And so I just wanted to hear what you guys had, what experience you guys have had with fasting. But for me, that's one of the big benefits of keto and IQ right now as that bridge and just to have it available when I want something. And the caloric load does not affect me in any way. Right, exactly. And I think in the long run, a lot of people are like, oh, isn't that cheating? Or I'm not, I'm not burning my own fats for ketones. Ultimately, it's 70 calories. You can burn that off right away, you know, in a few hours, even when you're sitting down. So what it does, it, it does upregulate the uh, enzymes and transporters related to keto metabolism when you have it acutely. So when you swap back to your endogenous ketone, whenever you use up the exogenous ketone, you are primed and ready to metabolize your endogenous ketones. 
actually, Rob, you 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 pointed out a good good point around electrolytes when uh, people go fasting, and I we get a lot of questions around this as well. Electrolytes, what people often have problems with is not sodium, right? Because they can get sodium easily. What they usually have problems with is potassium. What, in your opinion, um, is a good source of potassium when people are fasting, um, you know, to, to get that source of potassium? Well, I, I think the, the best place to do this, and when I do run or I do exercise, I will use one of the electrolyte mixes that have, by design, a high level of, of um, potassium without any carbohydrates or any sugars in them. And the two that I like are the LMNT and the Relight. I personally like the Relight. Um, so that is one of, the, it's just a personal choice of, of utilization, but I agree with that. However, having said that, if you are using, if you are supercharged with salt, remember that 96% of your potassium is intracellular, whereas about 90 plus percent of your sodium is intravascular. And if your body is trying to get rid of slightly excess salt, and it does throw in the colon, in the kidneys, in the in sweat, then um, as you get rid of that salt, you spare potassium. So it's not just the adding potassium to the system, it's extracting it from your cells and sparing it so that you're not exchanging. If you're low on sodium, you're exchanging sodium and potassium at a renal level, Got at it. a kidney level. So you wanna keep, absorb the potassium, exchange it for sodium in the kidney, and also extract the um, potassium using sodium potassium channels in the cells. So I really rely primarily on my potassium, my, my endogenous potassium, but you've got to get it from the cells into the bloodstream. And then you can supplement with some of the electrolyte mixes that are specifically designed in the space. And I think that combination, because getting yourself into ketosis, whether it's exogenous or endogenous, the, ex the exogenous is an accelerant toward glucagon and cellular demand. So it really just accelerates what you're looking for with a fast, which is to be in a state of ketosis and exactly. to have the fat cells be releasing fat, sending it to the liver to break it down into ketones. So that really is the effect. And I think from a brain energy perspective, there's also that transition as your blood sugars are going down, your ketones go up and the brain says, hey, I'm okay. I've got enough energy here. So on that run, I'm not bonking because my brain has a secondary energy. Part of it is the first time it doesn't work so well because your body's not used to that exchange. But as you get used to it, and that's why I say do it repetitively. And that's why for me, it's every Monday through the month of June and longer. I'm going to extend that longer where I'm getting my body attuned to that. So I, I think that is such an important space. And I think fasting has had its own entity where you can eat what you want to, but fast. And I don't think, in my opinion, that's the right approach. I think what you want to do is to start a low carbohydrate diet, a ketogenic diet, and then use fasting as it comes along and just, hey, I'm feeling okay, I'm not going to eat. And the ketones help you to bridge, the exogenous ketones help you to bridge across that. So that is our philosophy. And we like fasting um, for certain people. Now, people that are underweight, people that are tremendous athletes, they may not benefit from that prolonged fasting, but we can go into that at another time. But that is an excellent summary from both of us. Uh, and that's what I like about these discussions is we're able to share that knowledge. Absolutely. 